Nintendo can't afford to get this wrong. For nearly a decade, they've been working on building their infrastructure, developing their partnerships, and even setting up the new company, Nintendo Systems, last year, staffed by some key figures. Now, with apps, theme parks, films, and the imminent launch of a new console to succeed, the immensely successful Switch, they are relying on Nintendo accounts more than ever. In their words from their last annual report, the accounts are the connection that spans platform generations and unites a variety of entertainment experiences centered on our integrated hardware hardware software entertainment. So, we're going to do an exhaustive breakdown of Nintendo's online offering so far, examine the status quo at present, and look into some possible moves for the future. Who are Nintendo systems, and which famous faces are at the helm? How has the take-up of NSO really been? And what's the future of the expansion pack? We're going to look at it all. Yes, it's time for another Nintendo forecast deep dive. First, let's look at how we got here. Nintendo had dabbled with various loyalty and retention programs before, such as Club Nintendo, but the company really made this a focus from 2015. On the 17th of March 2015, mere months before he passed away, Satoru Iwata announced a partnership with mobile technology specialist DNA. Nintendo accounts were first introduced in February 2016, bringing together mobile, Wii U and 3DS game logins into a single account. During 2016, it developed, in their words, the research and development structure for smart device software to promote the planning and development of smart device application software and the development of a back-end server system. The Nintendo Switch Online service was announced prior to the launch of the Switch as a paid service, but the launch of this service was delayed. I think it's worth noting how many early Switch titles were online focused though. After the Switch's launch in March, its next three first-party titles, Mario Kart 8 Deluxe in April, ARMS in June and Splatoon in July, all involved a heavy online element. Of course, Mario Kart was always going to be an early title, Splatoon was an obvious port after its Wii U success, and ARMS doubled as a good tech demo for using the Switch's Joy-Con, but nevertheless, it gave Nintendo a long run to get their internet service working well. In the end, the actual online service was not announced until May 2018, with a launch in September. At first, the service boasted cloud saves and a selection of Famicom titles, but not a lot else. The first major game release to utilize the online features was Super Smash Bros. Ultimate in December, and while the game itself was a critical darling, it received negativity for the online elements. Not just from the gaming press, but Business Insider called out the persistent lag that proved the gaming giant still hasn't figured out how to make online games. Nevertheless, early take-up was significant, with 10 million accounts reported by July 2019. Remember, at this point, Smash had sold 14 million, and Mario Kart 8 Deluxe nearly 18 million. But both these games have full-featured offline offerings. Splatoon 2, though, a game whose major feature relied on the online service, had sold 9 million copies. And while all of those might not be active users two years later, it suggested that early take-up was more for the pragmatic need to play online than for any groundswell of enthusiasm for playing River City Ransom on the NES. September 2019 saw the release of the Super Famicom titles and that November Pokemon Sword and Shield launch. Plus, of course, the iconic Tetris 99 was also a 2019 game. Nintendo reported 15 million news by January 2020, but the fortune of the service changed significantly during 2020 for obvious reasons. By September, the number of subscribers had shot up to 26 million and it was 32 million in 2021. This seems to be the point at which Nintendo considered their market fairly thoroughly saturated. It's difficult to tell exactly what the balance is between new subscribers coming on board against old subscribers leaving the service. Shantaro Furukawa only mentioned in Investors Q&A that there were people who were leaving the service, but they were simply outnumbered by people joining it. Nevertheless, October 2021 saw the release of the expansion pack with N64 titles and Sega Mega Drive or Genesis in America games added to the system. The addition of a Sega console was particularly interesting, as although Nintendo had already showcased individual games on the platform from other developers, this was the first full-fledged non-Nintendo console. We'll come back later to Nintendo's relationships with Sega and some other major companies, but the expansion pack also surprised through the inclusion of Bundle DLC, most notably the Happy Home Paradise expansion for Animal Crossing New Horizons. Although the idea of DLC, essentially for hire, drew some criticisms early on, when you think about the size of New Horizons install base and the potential sales of the DLC outright, it showed the importance Nintendo placed on developing the online service that they offered it as a feature with the expansion pack. While membership of the core service reached 36 million in 2022 and 38 million in 2022, 23 after the addition of Game Boy games, the growth in the expansion pack provision, bolstered by the Game Boy Advance in February 2023, 
is more murky. Shintaro Furukawa would only be drawn to comment in 2022 that the number of Nintendo Switch Online Plus Expansion Pack members is steadily increasing, and its share among the overall Nintendo Switch Online subscriber base is gradually expanding. By region, the ratio is especially high in the United States which could of course simply be a way of saying that the ratio is low elsewhere. Nevertheless, behind the scenes another big shift was taking place with the announcement in 2022 that Nintendo were deepening their partnership with DNA. It's also worth noting that Nintendo owns a small number of shares in DNA and expressed its rationale for owning these as for the purpose of maintaining and developing a stable business relationship with this company with the aim of promoting business collaborations on the development, operation, etc. of the Nintendo account system and applications for smart devices. The outcome of this alliance was very intriguing. Not just an ad hoc working relationship, but the formation of a brand new company, Nintendo Systems, replete the snazzy website with some rather telling job vacancies listed. Notable roles they are advertising for include a project manager for a game tournament event, a web browser developer engineer for a game console, someone working what they call a cloud center of excellence, and a general purpose game server engineer, presumably to avoid having multiple engines across their different online games. Look, these aren't astonishing revelations about Nintendo's intention, but the scale and comprehensiveness of these job titles shows that, contrary to their reputation for being flat-footed on digital, they are actually quite determined to push forward and make this work. And what really shows this is not so much who they're hiring, but who they've already brought in. Nintendo System's welcome message says they are led by a team of engineers from Nintendo and DNA to create a system that makes it easy to deliver Nintendo entertainment to customers. Well, they are certainly led by engineers, as one of the directors of the company is none other than Shinya Takahashi. You may recognize Shinya Takahashi from Nintendo Directs and even the Switch launch, but among his many roles on Nintendo, he leads Nintendo's first-party game development department, EPD. If there was ever a sign that Nintendo sees a big future in online-focused entertainment, this is it. Under Takahashi are a mix of names, including Kenta Sugawara, who worked on the network for Super Mario Run, and Keigo Watanabe, who is DNA's executive officer. Then there's Yusuke Beppo, who is an executive officer in charge of business development for Nintendo. He has internet movie database credits with both the Super Mario movie and the Kirby animated series. And perhaps most intriguing of all is Kenji Yamamoto. This is quite a common name. Around 1 million people in Japan are called Yamamoto, and Kenji is a popular boy's name. Nintendo has at least two Kenji Yamamotos, and I'm as likely suspect as a programmer turned supervisor who started work in 1991 on the original Mario Kart. But the most intriguing Kenji Yamamoto would be the composer of the Metroid series and former group manager of the sound department. Having someone with deep music experience working on the Nintendo system development would make a lot of sense, especially if they want to tap into surely the most underutilized asset they have, their deep library of absolutely sensational game music. Super Smash Bros. Ultimate cultivated a stirring library, but that's nothing compared to what Nintendo could put out if they had a mind to do so. The rest of the Nintendo system's mission statement isn't hugely illuminating, but does contain some hints as to their direction of travel. As it states, as there are many technological innovations in the world, members with various strengths actively discuss while valuing the spirit of originality and flexibility, aiming for big results that cannot be achieved alone and working sincerely to create systems. We are working on this. They also state it is expected that technological developments surrounding entertainment will continue to develop. We will continue to incorporate a variety of technologies from old ones to cutting edge ones and strive to bring smiles to the faces of as many customers as possible through Nintendo's entertainment. Nintendo has famously shied away from overuse of cutting edge technology for the simple and understandable reason that new tech is incredibly expensive much of the time. Gunpei Yokoi, the Game Boy creator, suggested that Nintendo's way of adopting technology was lateral thinking with seasoned technology. Basically, take old tech and think of new ways to apply it. Of course, cutting edge technology may be boilerplate corporate speak. I don't expect Nintendo to change its long established approach, but the references to internal discussions suggest that Nintendo at least wants a level of external challenge from outside to explore whether new technologies can be integrated into their games and systems at a faster pace. Still, for all the focus being put into the technology, it's curious that there are some missed opportunities. For example, Super Nintendo World has a feature called a power-up band, allowing you to collect coins and other features as you go around the theme park. It can even be used to unlock challenges and keep track of scores on the Mario Kart ride. To operate it, you need to download an app. Surely, you say, this is the perfect vehicle for Nintendo to have its own app, linked to the Nintendo account system. But no, the app required is the Universal Studios Hollywood app. Now granted, 
Universal are running the experience, so it's not unreasonable for them to want to funnel people towards their own app, but it does strike me as curious since this is such an obvious funnel for the theme park visitors to enter the Nintendo online ecosystem. I think Nintendo does understand its own limitations and puts trust in external partners, but the last annual report does address that the company wants to, in their words, strengthen the touch points and develop the long-term relationship with each of our customers with Nintendo account as the connection that spans platform generations and unites a variety of entertainment experiences centered on our integrated hardware software entertainment. Basically, games are still the focus, but all those touch points for Nintendo products, theme parks, films, merchandise, are opportunities to bring players into the Nintendo ecosystem, and at the heart of that is getting account members through the door. Very significant, though, is the reference to uniting entertainment experiences. An obvious way to do this would be through adding Nintendo's films and television series as a streaming service on, on Nintendo Online. I don't think this is necessarily a sure thing. Nintendo's international partners have their own streaming services, and exclusivity for big films like Nintendo's can be a valuable prize. While having Nintendo films accessible from consoles might seem like an obvious move, owners of Nintendo consoles are likely to already be invested in Nintendo's ecosystem. And so while adding this kind of content provides a marginal extra benefit for existing supporters, it's not really strengthening a touch point so much as reinforcing their existing offer. On the other hand, having Mario or other franchises prominent on non-Nintendo streaming services provides a much better advertisement for their wares. So far, the Mario movie has been on Universal's own streaming service Peacock before moving to Netflix, so it's certainly doing the rounds and garnering attention. Once interest in the Mario movie wanes, I could see it being added latterly to the Nintendo Online service as an additional offer, but I'd say there's only a 30% chance of it being added before the end of 2025. Still. If Nintendo isn't looking to add value to the provision of movies, how else can it do so? First of all, let's consider what Nintendo are unlikely to do. I do not expect this to ever turn into a Game Pass-style console flush with new entries or even recent titles. Look at the almighty battle Reggie fils had with Nintendo of Japan in 2006 when the Reginator wanted Wii Sports to be a packing title with the Wii. Shigeru Miyamoto admonished Reggie and Mike Fukuda but proposed in the plan. Neither of you understands the challenges of creating software that people love to play. This is something we constantly push ourselves to do. We do not give away our software. Obviously a Game Pass service is not quite giving games away for free but Nevertheless, I suspect it would be a huge cultural leap for Nintendo, and probably a leap too far, for them not just to offer the occasional free downloadable title or piece of DLC, but to actually offer full-fledged games readily available on a subscription basis. But what about the free titles they've put out exclusive to NSO? Two, Super Mario Bros. 35 and Pac-Man 99 have turned out to be limited-run games and then withdrawn from availability, while Tetris 99 falls into the too-big-to-kill category. Or at least I hope so, because I love Tetris 99. Granted, it's a tricky balancing act between having a steady rhythm of game releases and also not letting too much out at once, but I think to some degree Nintendo has a justifiable caution, especially given that remakes of past games are still big business for them, as games like Zelda's Link Awakening and Super Mario RPG demonstrate. If they were to suddenly drop a whole ton of new games, it would definitely inspire subscribers, but the risk you get is these subscribers just there for the new thing, and they might be less likely to stick around. However, by sticking to a cautious approach, Nintendo have built up their online presence step by step, and people know what they're getting. It may not be very much to start with, but they haven't emptied the options box for later by putting everything out there now, and over recent years, people have started to come around to the idea that the Nintendo online service actually is starting to provide some really good value. However, with so many people rebooting their membership in October 2021 to account for the new expansion pack, they may wish to consider the offer again before the end of the year. And so there is a danger period for Nintendo around the October window. This means I think it's very likely that they will want to provide some substantial new offer around then in order to keep people on board. Having people fall out of the Switch ecosystem right before a new system launch would be catastrophic, so what could they do? I guess the obvious big one is to add further game systems. The question of new retro consoles, if that's not a contradiction in terms, feels less certain at present though. Three core consoles and three on the expansion pack feels like a good number, and as much as there was a flurry of excitement over the announcements of the N64 and Mega Drive titles in 2021, and then the Game Boy and Game Boy Advance titles in 2023, new announcements have slowed down to a crawl. Still, the original data mine of N64 titles suggested there would be 38 titles and 32 have been released. For Genesis or Mega Drive, this number is 45 out of a possible 52. This doesn't prevent them from porting more, of course, but it does suggest that they will need to at least consider whether Game Boy Advance is sufficient to keep the system in new games and respond accordingly. What are their options? Well, there's a lot more than you might expect. 
GameCube is perhaps the obvious next step, being the sequel system to N64. If N64 reached NSO on its 25th anniversary, the equivalent anniversary of the GameCube would be 2027. Nevertheless, its presence is far from certain. Just pragmatically, an insightful comment on a previous video noticed that the SD card space needed to hold multiple GameCube games would make them an unlikely fit for the service. Also, the GameCube is an absolute goldmine of games that feel modern enough that they could be remade for Switch. Metroid Prime Remastered is, of course, already a winner, and Wind Waker and Twilight Princess are probably out there somewhere waiting for their day in the sun. Even if they don't go down the remake route, we've seen that even a bare-bones remaster can work for them. Pikmin 1 and 2 were a delightful surprise, and we know they have a version of Super Mario Sunshine as it was on the limited edition 3D All-Stars collection. Plus, the rumour mill is working overtime on other GameCube classics for Switch. However, while releasing more GameCube games certainly makes sense for a short-term sales perspective, if they sell these as only one-off purchases, Nintendo doesn't benefit from the safe, reliable trickle of regular cash that a subscription model provides. Businesses rely on certainty, especially when it comes to their income stream. The uncertainty of releasing individual games and seeing how they fare has to be set against the promise of regular income, plus the chance that people will experience new franchises they would otherwise have overlooked. Having all these games accessible through a single service also exposes new audiences to older franchises. I really doubt I would have fallen in love with Kuro Kuro Kurin were it not for its appearance on the Game Boy Advance app, as I don't think I was even aware of this game in the noughties, when I was originally playing my Game Boy Advance. All things considered, I would say the chances of GameCube releasing as a system before the end of 2025 are very low, about 10%. The DS feels like a safer step in many ways. Yes, it's chronologically later than the GameCube, but because it's a handheld, its games feel a lot further from the current day, and so offer fewer options for porting, short of doing full remakes. Even if they started releasing these DS titles soon, Nintendo would take years, allowing for any DS remakes that Nintendo still wishes to do to be created for the Switch and Switch 2. By the end of 2025, it will be a significant time since the last console, so I would put the DS at a 30% chance. But there are other consoles that would make prime opportunities. Sega's Mega Drive or Genesis console was a particularly pleasant surprise, hitting my nostalgic 90s sweet spot square on, and I have to imagine that Sega are happy with the arrangement. As with Nintendo, it gives them a steady trickle of income from their back library. Is it possible that other Sega systems could come? Certainly, the Game Gear and Master System have been regularly emulated before. And the only issue with these is that many of the Game Gear games are just Master System games rejigged for the small screen. Hopefully, some common sense would be applied and the wider screen versions would be utilised, but since Sonic Origins DLC managed to include Game Gear versions with cropped screens, who knows? It still feels like low-hanging fruit, especially as an option for a base tier of NSO. I guess the question here is one of demand. Sega already collected Mega Drive classics for the Switch, but didn't collect Master System classics, and one has to think there was a reason for this. As much as the Master System had a big following, especially in Brazil, it's difficult to see many people here getting too excited about it. Is it worth the cost for Sega and Nintendo to emulate the Master System, probably only for low customer interest? The Nintendo Entertainment System might not have garnered interest either, but it's a core part of Nintendo's history in a way that the Master System simply isn't. I suspect that it's reasonably likely to happen eventually, if only to add some additional content, but I don't know how soon, and I put it as top whack 30% likelihood before 2025. The Mega CD and 32X games were so limited in number that I half expect they wouldn't even create a new app for them, but just advertise them as an extra feature built into the Mega Drive app. The chance to play Shining Force CD and Knuckles Chaotix aside, I doubt there's much excitement on these systems, and is it really worth the development costs? That said, as the Mega Drive wraps up, it's quite low hanging fruit. By the end of 2025, I rate their inclusion at a low chance, around 30%, but rising to near certainty in the long term, as long as Sega's partnership with Nintendo continues. A more fertile library for inclusion could be the Sega Saturn. I will declare an interest here, as I've always been a huge admirer of the chronically underrated penultimate Sega system. The trouble with the Saturn is that very few people are going to be getting excited about this notorious flop of a system coming to NSO, but the Wii U of its day it is bursting with the most amazing library of first-party titles that almost nobody has ever played. Panzer Dragoon Saga, Shining Force 3, Guardian Heroes, Dark Savior, Fighters Megamix, Shining the Holy Ark, Sega Rally, Knights of the Dreams, Backer Backer Animal. It remains a beloved and frequently revisited retro console for me. Remaking any of these games is a pain in the neck since the Saturn's weird fusion of two CPUs made it near impossible to code for effectively back in the day and make it a pain in the neck to do much with now, giving the games a blocky look by even early 3D standards, with luxuries like transparencies being a rare treat only top coders like Traveller's Tales could pull off. 
and moreover the Saturn has always been notoriously difficult to emulate, but Modern Vintage Gamer identified that a working Saturn emulator on Switch has been used to power the game Cotton Guardian 4 Saturn Tribute, a game so obscure that even this mad keen Saturn fan of yore hadn't heard of it. Admittedly, the game appears to have struggled with some lag and other issues, but it seems to me completely in Sega's interest to develop their own emulator. I would love it and it would be great to see digital foundries Rich Ledbetter reviewing the tech in a return to his roots as the editor of the fantastic Sega magazine and then Sega Saturn magazine, but I'm not going to overhype this. This is a very low chance before 2025, just 10% and a low chance in the absolute sense, even though I think the rich library of Saturn games really deserves to be rediscovered and I think there are huge opportunities for Sega to capitalise on a forgotten part of their history. However, Sega's equally catastrophic but better remembered console the Dreamcast may have more potential. The Dreamcast benefits from being massively easier to port from since it was based on Microsoft Windows CE and may hold particular attraction for Sega and Nintendo because it was canary down the mine in terms of the potential for online play. A metaphor let's be clear in which the canary, like the Dreamcast, abruptly died and was never heard from again. Well, will that canary zombie return like some kind of torture distended metaphor? The risk for Sega is that the Dreamcast is a fertile playground for remakes, with the Sonic Adventure games, Crazy Taxi, Shenmue and others being true classics, but Sega's latest moves seem to be in the opposite direction, not remakes but rather revivals. In this sense, promoting Dreamcast games on a platform like NSO could be to Sega's benefit, as long as the old games don't compete with their new ones. Still, I think this is a long shot. Burning off a few Mega Drive titles on NSO makes sense for them as they weren't doing much with them anyway, but I imagine use of the Dreamcast library would involve some pretty hard-headed negotiations between Nintendo and Sega, and Nintendo are at best indifferent to third parties, while Sega may want a larger share of any profits. It would absolutely be a feather in the cap of the online service though, and I could definitely see the Dreamcast being a premier addition as a stopgap for the GameCube and Nintendo DS. Although it's not a particularly high chance, I'd still put it at up to 30% likelihood that we will get Dreamcast games. There are, of course, many other obscure possibilities that Nintendo could explore. What about Game & Watch? What about Satellaview? Or 64DD titles? Or Virtual Boy? Heck, if they really want to pay tribute to genius Game Boy creator Gunpei Yokoi, what about a revival for the games console everyone has been waiting to see with bated breath? The one, and only, Bandai Wonderswan. Yes, this was the console that Gunpei Yokoi developed, for Bandai back in the 90s. Look, individually none of these are even remotely likely, but collectively and for novelty value, I think there is a very slim chance that something a little bit weird and obscure will be added to NSO in due course. Yet again, it's the time frame that causes the issue. In a 20 year time frame, I think the chances are good of something weird coming along, maybe in 2039 to mark the 150th anniversary of Nintendo as a company, but I can't see it in the near term, so I'd say it's a 10% chance that something obscure gets a release via NSO. You may have noticed that all of these are rated as low chances. Of course, collectively, the chances are high of there being some kind of new console, but with Game Boy games being an almost endless mine of great titles for the base price, it only remains for them to shore up the expansion pack and one of DS or Dreamcast or perhaps selection of individual GameCube games would do the job nicely I think. But another method Nintendo has been exploring in recent years is giving subscribers DLC access. The logic of their approach to this, it seems to me, has been less about promoting the games but using their two gigaton hit Switch titles to promote the online service, hence using Animal Crossing and Mario Kart. Following this line of logic, the next most likely candidates would be Splatoon 3 and Super Smash Bros. Ultimate. I think Ultimate is less likely to feature as additional DLC on NSO because that's a game that could easily be resold for the next console as a fully feature complete edition. Also, many of the Smash DLC fights are from third parties and would probably involve lots of intense negotiations. First party characters like Byleth and Min Min would certainly be possibilities for the Nintendo Switch Online, but it feels unlikely to me that they would just pull a few fighters out. The only reason this might work is that the Smash announcements were so cheeky and hype fueled, and I can see for Nintendo getting to redo those occasional announcements with new fighters coming to NSO could give a bit of a hype boost to the service and simultaneously give the Super Smash Bros. Ultimate game an advertising blitz every few months without significant cost to Nintendo. As for Splatoon 3, it seems believable that the side order DLC will eventually come to NSO like Splatoon 2's did, but I think this will be a long way in the future as it's only recently released. As I say, the tradition so far has been for the service to use the company's most premier titles to get it off the ground, but now that it is well established, perhaps it could be used in reverse. 
torn on the Golden Country is almost a mini-game in its own right, and to those sceptical about jumping onto Xenoblade Chronicles, it could be a nice entry point to a series that can appear somewhat forbidding to get into. Perhaps therefore using DLC as a way to introduce people to different games might be tempting. After all, if you don't originally own the core game, but you know that you can get an extended version of it through the Nintendo Switch Online, a subscription you're already paying for, perhaps it would be tempting to jump into some new titles. But look, so far we've covered the traditional ways that Nintendo's account can be leveraged to help the Switch succeed. But now, let's look at more non-traditional methods. One possibility is one that is bonkers but might be worth considering. I've got a separate video linked in the card above about the possibility of Nintendo going down the route of digital first premieres to avoid spoilers and the seemingly inevitable leaks that haunt their big games. I think this is still relatively unlikely for all sorts of reasons, but what if they were to flip the script and allow digital first previews to NSO subscribers? Clearly this would only work for games which are widely hyped and the move could easily backfire as gating expensive releases behind a further paywall. Still, Nintendo does occasionally dip its toes into ideas in a small way, even if it attracts some controversy. See the limited release of Super Mario 3D All-Stars. Imagine Metroid Prime 4 accessible 14 days early for Nintendo Switch Online subscribers, a way for the most committed players to experience a story absolutely spoiler-free. This wouldn't be quite as polarizing as digital first launches outright, since it would reputatively be a reward for Nintendo's loyal subscribers, and you can absolutely bet that NSO subs would soar for the chance to get into some of Nintendo's marquee titles that much earlier. I don't think this is a route Nintendo will pursue though. In particular, suggesting that early access avoids spoilers is tantamount to admitting that they can't control the seemingly inevitable drumbeat of pre-release leaks, and that's not something that Nintendo will want to advertise, even if it seems to be true. Still, I wouldn't be surprised if there were at least some conversations on the topic of exclusive rewards. Another option in this vein would be using NSO subscriptions as a way to allocate early Switch 2s. If you're anything like me, you're already dreading the challenge of actually getting your hands on Nintendo's next console, and so giving preferential treatment early on to the most loyal fans would be a reassuring move and an effective way to scupper scalpers. Try saying that three times fast. For argument's sake, let's say they announce a Switch 2 in October. Now, anyone thinking of jumping off the NSO train on the anniversary of the expansion pack launch would suddenly pump the brakes if they realise that their membership is going to allow them access to the new console a little bit earlier. However, there's one last possible exclusive for online subscribers, one last concept which could be really game-changing for Nintendo in terms of encouraging its existing base to upgrade. This is in the realms of backwards compatibility. If Switch 2 is backwards compatible with games, there's a lot of speculation that Nintendo will find a way to offer digital upscaling of old titles. But really, how sustainable is that business model? The games where take-up would be highest are the ones that would benefit from full-fat remakes down the line anyway. Your Breath of the Wilds. On the other hand, there are many great games where people might not be too bothered about paying for a one-off graphical bump. I love Luigi's Mansion 3, but I don't know I desperately need to see it with slightly better graphics. But if instead of a one-off fee per game, what if this was a service that was offered as integral to the online service? Now, dozens of first-party Switch games play even better on Switch for members of the online service, or at least the pertinent tier. Instead of announcing occasional Game Boy drops, they could announce which old titles are getting a fresh leak of paint and therefore advertise to their most loyal customers, customers most predisposed to give Kirby Star Allies or Pikmin 3 Deluxe or Hyrule Warriors Age of Calamity a go for the first time when they find the up version is now available as a membership exclusive. While advertising N64 games or Game Boy titles reinforce the value of the service, advertising Switch up not only reinforces the service, but also gently nudges people to check out games they were probably already predisposed to be interested in, but may never have actually checked out. After all, once you're able to get an exclusive up it would be rude not to try the actual game, wouldn't it? I think this strategy has a lot to recommend it, and might be something that Nintendo could consider to keep the original Switch library intact as they move forward onto their new system. This means that old Switch games could be removed from circulation, loyal fans could get up versions with a subscription, while old titles could be re-released at full price on the new system. A win for fans and Nintendo. Of course, there's no definitive proof either way of this, but Either way, Shantura Furukawa did make this rather interesting comment at a recent investors meeting. In order to continue to propose Nintendo's unique entertainment offerings, we believe that the dedicated games console business that integrates hardware and software is the best business at this time, and we will continue to engage in research and development based on this policy. Even before the game's released, we have been working with DNA to promote the use of Nintendo accounts. 
Nintendo accounts are an important point of contact for long-term connections with customers and we believe they can be used not only during hardware migrations but also as a means of reconnecting with customers who have been away from games for a while and at some point became interested in Nintendo's unique entertainment proposals. From this point of view, I believe that the importance of Nintendo accounts will not change in the future. How that precise importance will develop remains to be seen and I for one will be keeping a very close eye on what happens next coming out of Nintendo systems. I always appreciate the thoughtful response in the comments, so after you've liked and commented and subscribed, please let me know your take on all this before following the link on screen for another in-depth analysis, this one on Nintendo's Digital First Strategy, or another video on Tears of the Kingdom director Hidemaru Fujibashi and his history. Thank you so much for watching Nintendo Forecast, and see you soon.